Welcome back to another edition of the Night Report Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Broadbent. Joining me once again is my co-host, Richie Schneiderite, and a very special guest, friend of the pod, returning to talk bye week and everything the rest of the season. Quarterback, former Rutgers quarterback, Mike Teal. Thanks for joining us, man. Thanks for having me. What's going on, guys? How's everything? Man, uh, is there anything season. better than, you know, sitting pretty on a bye week after you've clinched a bowl for the first time in almost a decade? This feels great. <laughs> And it being October still, it's pretty darn October good. October still, man, we got <laughs> yeah. Halloween weekend coming up. How much to complain about here? Um, Speaking of that, are yeah, you, you do you think the the team is overperformed or about where you expected heading into the bye, uh, going six and two in the first eight games? Listen, I, I think if you look at their schedule in the beginning of the season, you know, not knowing what was going to happen with any of these teams, Northwestern in the opener is a toss up. Yep. Um, Virginia Tech, you know, at home is one that you kind of have to win, but it could go either way. I mean, you look at what Virginia Tech did last night. They, they blew seven yeah. games out. Um, so they're probably a better team than they were earlier on in the season. Um, Absolutely. But, you know, listen, it is what it is. And then and then you beat Michigan State at home, and Michigan State, you know, perennially has been one of the, the better teams in the conference. So to be 6-2, and two, to play Michigan really tough on the road and, you know, really have a chance in the fourth quarter to be in the game, the Wisconsin one is the one that kind of, you know, let you let slip away a little bit. But I think overall, you've got to be happy with it, right? You're six and two. You've clinched bowl eligibility. Um, there's there's a little bit of a stretch now that they go into, you know, playing, I think, three out of four ranked teams um, mm -hmm. to, to finish the year. But, you know, to this point, I think they're, you know, exceeded expectations and, and right where they need to be to have a chance to possibly win seven, maybe eight games. Kind of piggybacking on that one. I know Gavin Wimsett said didn't throw the ball a ton last week, but how would you just kind of grade his performance as a quarterback overall up to this point? Because you've seen camp, you've seen him in games. Yeah, I mean, he's gotten better. Listen, is he as good as he's going to be? Not even close. But mm -hmm. I think with any young quarterback, you want to see a player, you know, take strides and make progress. And I think the addition of Kirk Shiraka has really helped accelerate that process for him. Um, you know, they they have an identity and they know who they are on offense. They're not asking him to go out and win the game. They're asking him to convert third downs and, mm -hmm. you know, and hit some shots down the field over the course of the game to, to lighten up the box so they can run the football. And that's exactly what he's done. He's taken good care of the ball for the most part. Um, you know, he's missed on some opportunities, but he's made some really good throws in critical situations. You know, you look back at the Indiana game on fourth down, the convert to, to Dremel to stay on the field. You know, that's mm -hmm. the type of play that changes that outcome of the game. Um, doesn't really go down in the stat sheet. But those are the other plays that he's been able to make. And you know, listen, I, I think he's only going to get better as he plays more, as the talent around him you know, gets better. You see guys like Ian Strong and some of these young guys starting to really kind of cement themselves into you know, a, a role um, within mm -hmm. the offense. So as those guys get better, he's going to continue to get better. You talked about kind of how important it is for, based on when you play a team in the season. Like we played Virginia Tech the first week Kyron Jones yeah. started a game. And now he's, you know, blowing teams out by 30. You, know, you got to think also, if we play Wisconsin this week versus when we did, you know, they lost Tanner Mordecai, their starting quarterback. They've looked totally different since then. Mm -hmm. It's just like you kind of got to take the opportunities as they come. And sometimes they break your way and sometimes they don't. It's just, you know, sometimes you got to get lucky, too. It's just the way it bounces. And that's so yeah. important to show you, though, the, the depth, overall depth of a program. Obviously, you take a quarterback out. You know, that's tough for any program in the country. But, mm -hmm. you know, I think one of the things that they've shown, Rutgers has shown as far as being able to progress and start to take that next step is just overall depth, you know, on both sides of the football. They've rotated a ton of guys on the offensive line. They've done the same thing on defense. Um, you know, when you have some depth, you can, you know, play through some of those injuries that, you know, last year, year before, year before that, they might not have been able to do. Yeah. Um, talking about the offense, you were talking about uh, the skill position players around him. Uh, Kyle Manungai, you coached him in high school. I know I personally know the backstory, but just tell us the backstory of how he ended up at Rutgers and how Shiano kind of recruited him. Yeah, so he he was, in my opinion, if not the best, one of the best running backs in the state, you know, his, his mm -hmm. junior and senior year. And um, at, at the time, you know, when he was being recruited as a junior, I think, Chris Ash was still the head coach and Nunzio Campanelli was the recruiter up in the area. And I would tell Nunzio mm -hmm. every, every time I talked to him, I said, Nunz, you guys, <laughs> you have to take this kid. You know, he's a difference maker. And, and frankly, Rutgers mm -hmm. isn't going to get a four-star running back right now. You can't block 
you know, zone run, you know, take a kid like this and, and you're going to have a chance to really, you know, mm -hmm. have something special. So pounded the table. They weren't sure about him. They weren't sure about him. Finally, they decided to take him. And then I forget, you know, he was a senior and I had left. So the transition, I don't know if Coach Shiano had come back already and Coach Ash was gone or mm -hmm. it was after Coach Shiano got here that Kyle committed. Um, but but the end of Kyle's high school year, obviously, you know, Rutgers was the only place that really he had an opportunity to play big time football at. And, you know, I guarantee you those guys are, are happy that they made that decision to take a chance on him back then. And, and then I kind of want to ask you to piggyback off that, too. Was he this good of a pass blocker and pass pro in high school as he is right now? Because this man is just lighting up defenders. And look at the way he's <laughs> lead blocking when when yeah. Wimps is running the yeah, football he's too. Yeah, too. <laughs> that that's what he was. He catches the ball out of the backfield. He can pass protect on third down. He can run block when it's quarterback run. He's literally a complete back. The biggest mm -hmm. knock on him, I think, was just his overall top end speed. They're like, oh, he can't really run away from guys. Can't. I said, well, who cares? He can do everything else. <laughs> You know, if, if you want yeah. a player that's going to help you, he's the player. And at the absolute worst, they would have got a great special teams player. But now he's the Big Ten leading rusher, you know. Yeah. But I think I, I was saying this to someone the other day. The difference this year compared to last year with Kyle is you've seen him run away from people. He didn't do that last year. Yeah. So mm -hmm. he's committed to the, the strength and conditioning program. Jay Butler obviously does a tremendous job. He always has. And when you have a guy that, that loves football, commits to the offseason strength program, you're seeing the results on the field. And he's been as dominant as a player as, as Rutgers had in, in, you know, at least my recent memory. Yeah, and I guess those things like like the ability and willingness to block, that's that's kind of like a, a toughness and mentality thing. Some guys got that dog in them. Some, some guys don't. Some guys are built like Tarzan and play like Jane. Other guys, the opposite. Is that something that you – like? tried to help the, the staff know, like, this guy is going to do everything you ask him to do. He's going to do the dirty work. Is that something that, like, is just really hard for a, a staff to trust when you're when you're kind of hyping a guy up to a coaching staff? I, I guess. I, I, don't, I don't know what the issue was. You turn on the film, and if you actually watch the high school film, he's the best player on the field. So, like, sure. I, I, you know, you're the, the home state university. And, again, it was a different staff at the time and different people that are, that are there now. But – I said, just just watch the film, turn it on and watch it. And, and if you're a football recruiter, if you're a coach, you're going to say, this is the best player on the field. I want the best player on the field on my team. And, you know, he's been like that for a long time and, and he's continued to excel. And he's and he's, you know, he's like that right now, which is which is great for Rutgers. Yeah. Plus, he you saw his brother go okay. and have a really good career at Villanova, too. So it was clear mm -hmm. that they had the, the athletic bloodlines. Yeah, it was it was a very strange situation overall. Yeah. You mentioned Jay Butler before. I'm kind of curious. What – I just want to pick your brain a little bit, I guess. What makes him such a good strength and conditioning coach? You've had NFL strength and conditioning coaches. How would you compare and contrast him? Well, NFL guys, you know, the guys that are in the NFL are there for a reason, right? They're, they're the yeah. best of the best. They're – the strength coach in the NFL, their job is more to maintain and make sure these guys don't get hurt. It's the player's responsibility to train and do what he needs to do to, mm -hmm. to continue to be able to play at a high level college guys you're getting a, an 18 year old high school kid that some guys have never lifted before some were in more you know uh, sophisticated high school weight programs but you, you're teaching the fundamentals you're teaching the basics you're you're looking at you know if you think about it like in, in artwork you have a piece of clay mm -hmm. and you have the opportunity to mold this piece of clay and in doing so you're you're getting them stronger faster uh, you're doing injury prevention. Um, you know, I think the the analytics and the science piece has had always been a piece of Jay Butler's program. You know, even when I was there 15 years ago now, you know, when, when he was first at Rutgers, that was, you know, I'm willing to bet he was one of the first guys that really looked at, at analytics and numbers and looked at video to watch guys get, you know, rap, reps and make sure the, the reps were done correctly and all that stuff. But mm -hmm. when you compile that together with, with a – you know, a thought out process and plan on how to get any one player from point A to point Z over the course of his career. You know, I, I don't know what exactly the magic sauce is, but he has it and he's done it very, very well. And, you know, if everyone knew it, they probably try to emulate it, I'm sure. Sure. <clears throat> and that's like, a lot of it's just like sticking to your plan too, because I imagine like Gianno knew exactly what he needed to do when he stepped foot back on campus because he's done it before. 
you know, you got mm-hmm. a guy like Chris Ash who might not really know anything about the the area, know anything about the culture at the school. Gianna just knew like you got to kind of just deal with it for four years straight, and then you'll start to see the fruit. We're starting to see it now. Uh, but yeah, it's it's not easy to stick with a plan. Sometimes you don't see immediate results. You start to deviate, and then the results aren't there. So I think, in part, it's got to be just Butler knowing what it takes to to get the job done because he's done it for so long, right? Yeah, I mean, I think to your point, right? To to commit to something over a long period of time, especially in today's world and in college athletics, the you have to really take a look at the entire program, like almost holistically, right? You have to be mm-hmm. committed in every phase to develop, 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 and then eventually you get some better talent and you're able to develop better talent, which leads to better results on the field. And, you know, it's it's a grind when you're going through for two or three years and you're pounding your head and you see improvement, you know, because you see guys physically getting better. You see guys practicing harder, but then the results don't come on Saturday. It gets a little frustrating. You know, and I've made comments in the past, you can see a ton of improvement without seeing results on Saturday, you know, because those other guys are improving too, but that doesn't mean that you haven't gotten better. Uh, I think this year, finally, the results have proven that we've gotten better and we're in a much better place than we were two years ago, which frankly was probably needed from an administration standpoint, from a fan standpoint, and, and from a recruiting standpoint. And I'm sure when you have guys like Bo Melton, who have been in the program for, you know, four years prior to Shiano getting here, just seeing like, oh, man, this is different. This feels a lot different. We're, you know, we're competing better now. And I don't know what it exactly is, but whatever they're selling, I'm buying. And that probably helps the younger guys buying as well. Yeah, I mean, listen, I think anytime you come in to rebuild a program, especially when it's, you know, and as, as dire as I, I guess you could say it was when, when Greg came back, you got to compete. You got to compete in everything that you do, you know, whether it's in the classroom, whether it's in the weight room, whether it's on the field, uh, and you can't make it easy. You've got to kind of weed out the ones that want it to be easy and they'll go their own separate way. And that's fine. You know, cause at the end of the day, you're not going to win with those guys. You're going to win with guys that want to compete, that want to be the best, you know, guys like that, that, you know, guys like they have that play, you know, on Saturdays right now for them, the Manung guys of the world, the, you know, I hate to say this because you're a Burton Catholic guy, but the Johnny Langans of the world, like, <laughs> you know, th- those, those are the type of players that are going to help you, especially when you're in a rebuilding process. Uh, you mentioned Manung guy again, and I, I can't help but ask you this because everyone compares him to Rice. I, I want to hear your comparison. Is there, is there any comparison there? Is there, are they similar at all? I know the builds are kind of similar, but that's, that's kind of it, right? Bills are similar. Um, you know, listen, Ray is a once in a generation type guy. You know, he, mm-hmm. he's special. He was a you know pro bowler in the NFL. Um, you know, just the best back, in my opinion, to ever come out of Rutgers. With that being said, I think there's a lot of characteristics that, that Kyle has that Ray had. Um, the toughness. I think the biggest thing that, that shows out to me is as the game goes on, Kyle gets better. In the mm-hmm. fourth quarter of a game, Ray took it over. You know, when we beat Louisville, when we beat South Florida, you know, when they were ranked two in the country and three in the country, when, when we went down to, you know, West Virginia in that triple overtime game, you know, late in the game when, when we needed to, you know, either get a first down or control the ball, Ray took it over. Um, and, and that's, I think, what made him so special. You're starting to see that with Kyle, you know. Look at Michigan State, you know, for four quarters or three and a half quarters, you can't really do anything. And all of a sudden, he just keeps pounding on you and he's able to break, you know, a touchdown run. He's able to break, break a big first down run. Um, Indiana, they got the ball with, or maybe it was Michigan, they got the ball with seven minutes, uh, Michigan State, seven minutes left in the game, and they finished taking a knee. Um, that, that's, that's what Ray Rice would, would have done. And, and you're starting to see that a little bit with Kyle. Yeah, I think stylistically, they don't remind me of each other, but. They do remind me in the way that they run, if that makes sense, where like there's very rarely an instance where Kyle Manung is getting taken down behind the line of scrimmage. He's always going to take a two yard loss and do, a, you know, a one yard gain or he's always going to get those hidden yards where he's always falling forward or moving the pile for an extra one or two yards after the after the end of a play. That's kind of like what Ray was always doing, too. He was always making sure that that, you know, stop for, you know, a loss of two is always just, you know, a zero yard gain or a one yard gain. That's kind of the similarity I see. Yeah, I think Ray had had power, but he also had finesse to him. Kyle has a lot of power. 
Mm -hmm. Um, You know, he can make guys miss, don't get me wrong, but typically he's not avoiding the first contact because he made a miss. He's just running through contact, you know, getting that first down. Whereas Ray would make that first guy miss and then initiate contact as he's falling forward. Um, You know, again, Ray, uh, it's unfair, I think, to compare really anyone to Ray because of how special of a player he was. Yep. Um, But there's definitely uh, some similarities, I think, between the two. I said it before, you, you saw camp, you saw a couple practices for camp, you saw spring camp, you saw, saw training camp. What's, what's the biggest thing that surprised you so far this season with this team? Um, I, I don't know if anything's necessarily surprised me. I think we knew that the defense was going to be good. They were good last mm-hmm. year. Um, they had a lot of guys coming back. You know, that the, the front seven, I think, is probably the strength, but then also you look at, at the edges at corner, you know, you mm-hmm. have two great corners and then the addition of Flip Dixon, I think has been oh, yeah. uh, a huge, mm-hmm. huge boost to that defense. He's been, he's played very well. Um, probably on the offensive line. Um, that's, that's been the question mark. There's been a lot of mm-hmm. guys that have rotated through. Um, I, I think by, by coach Flaherty coming in and taking over that group, you've seen real development, which we haven't seen in, in a while. Um, and there's been some shuffling at that position mm-hmm. from a coaching standpoint. I think finally you have, uh, you know, a guy that has a plan that's done it before that knows how to get players ready to play. Um, and more than anything, they've, they've created some depth, you know, they've for most of the season rolled guys through at different positions um, you know, so that's a credit to, to, I think, you know, Pat Flaherty and the job he's done with the offensive line. Yeah. I think up and down the offense, the, the, the changes that Greg made in his staff this off season really kind of pointed to, I need guys who have been there, done that. Every single guy he added has been in that role at some point for over a decade. You got Kirk Soraka been an offense coordinator at the power five level for forever at this point. Flaherty was an offensive line coach in the NFL for 20 years. Dave Brock has been everywhere from FCS to the NFL and not to, you know, say anything bad about the guys they're replacing, but you know, we have guys who are new at their job, whether it be whatever industry you're in, there's going to be hiccups. There's going to be people who can't really cut it. And it's nice when you can bring in guys, you have absolute certainty can do the job because they performed it over and over and over, proved it at every level. You think that plays a big part in why the offense just looks so much better this year is they have coaches who really know what they're doing. Yeah, I think so. But I think, you know, just taking a step back before I answer that, I think if you look at, and this is just my opinion, I don't know this to be fact or not, but you you look at kind of the first staff that Greg hired, you know, in the recruiting landscape of college football, you want young, energetic coaches that are on the road yep. recruiting. And then the whole paradigm shifted with NIL, with the transfer portal. Um, and you don't necessarily need to, you know, be pounded on the road as much as, you know, paying a guy to come which that's just the reality of college football now. So I think that gave him the ability to bring in some of these more veteran coaches that, you know, maybe aren't the best recruiters on the road. But what they do is they develop players and it's shown on the field. And I think if you're if you're a portal player or if you're a high school player, you know, everyone's goal nowadays, if you're a kid coming out of high school and you're talking about getting NIL money, you're talking about eventually having an opportunity to play in the NFL. I think what these guys have done is they've shown you come here, we're going to develop you. We're going to get you ready to go play at that next level. And and that's what the offense has shown. I think you have a a veteran staff that has game planned extremely well, that has created an identity, which they haven't had in a long time. You know, they're going to run the football. They're going to try to run some play action pass down the field and, you know, protect the quarterback and and take care of the football and, and dominate the time of possession. Uh, they stick to it, which uh, I think is hard for a younger coach to do when when it's not really working, but you're able to stay to it. And, and part of the reason why the offense is able to stay to their plan is because the defense is so good. You know, defense keeps yep. games close and they're able to, you know, make it a one, two score game where in the fourth quarter you can keep running the football, where if it's a three or four score game, it gets a little bit out of hand. You got to change what you want to do. Um, so I think collectively they've played really complimentary football and they've done a really, really good job. Of, of knowing who they are in every phase and then doing what they want to do. You mentioned the transfer portal and, and Rutgers, they've, they've found a lot of really good players in the transfer portal, but it always kind of seems like it's a struggle to get kids from the portal at Rutgers. How much easier do you think it'll be to recruit kids from the portal, knowing that we're going, we're going to a bowl now, we've been putting kids in the NFL, you can just watch the Super Bowl, you got Isaiah Pacheco leading the, 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 the Chiefs since, you know, uh, at running back, and you've got a bunch of other guys in the NFL as well. 
is it so much easier now than last year to recruit from the portal, you think? Um, in, in that aspect, yes, um, because there's been, you know, you can talk about it all you want, but until you actually see the proof of development and success, you know, for a portal kid that has an option between here and, and some team that's, you know, been in a bowl game for the last 10 years, probably going there because they want to play in the postseason. Yep. Um, but I think on the flip side of that, the other thing within the portal that, again, this has kind of rocked the whole college football world is is the NIL stuff, right? You, you have to pay players. That's yeah. That's just what it is. Like, it still sounds wrong, you know, when you say it. But the reality of it is, you know, you've got to have support from the fan base and from donors to to raise this money to be able to pay the players to to come here and play. If you want the best players you know, you look at college football, you look at some of these quarterbacks that are making two, three, four million dollars in college football. It's it's an astronomical amount to play college football, but yep. that's what you have to do to get these top players. And, you know, the more they're able to generate the NIL stuff and, and fundraise for that, the, the easier it'll be to get players to come and play here um, without the on the field aspect that we've obviously seen improve. It kind of makes you wish uh, this was legal back in 2004, right? I wouldn't have <laughs> been complaining. <laughs> yeah, that 2016 would have made a lot of money. Oh, for sure. yeah. Yeah, yeah, it would have yeah. been nice. We paved, we paved the way. That's yeah. what we like did. to say. You did. You know. um, I, I want to talk more about the bye week. Uh, I'm looking back at some of, some of your stats post bye week. Um, phenomenal. I'm looking like. 276, three touchdowns, 310, two touchdowns, 215, three touchdowns. Um, what makes what is so important about the bye week for a quarterback, especially a developing one like Gavin? It's interesting. I never thought about that. Um, you know, I, I think more than anything, the season is such a grind and you're just go, go, go. You don't get a chance to really kind of self-coach and reflect. Like on Sunday, mm -hmm. when you come in and you and you watch the film. You, you fix the mistakes and it's game plan specific. You don't really talk about fundamentals at all. You don't really talk about technique. It's more so, you know, here was a too high snap with too high safeties. You were supposed to work this side of the field where you really mm -hmm. work that side. We got to fix that. You take a step back during the bye week and, and they're able to do self scout. They're able to do, you know, I'm sure they've, they've had, you know, one of the younger coaches, GAs or the player development guys go back and put together a reel of all of, of Gavin's, you know, snaps and throws. Uh, you're able to kind of critique and watch everything and, and just kind of get back to the fundamentals. Um, you're not game planning, so you're practicing against each other. It's going to be ones versus ones. You know, some guys are obviously going to get healthy and get a break. But, you know, for the quarterbacks, you're able to just go back to playing football, not having to install and learn a game plan in three days and go out and execute it, which is difficult, you know, because you have your base stuff, but there's always tweaks, especially as a young player um, like Gavin is or, or like I was when, when I was younger. It's good to just take a step back and, and just think about, you know, your own offense and your own system and then your true fundamentals and technique. Um, so kind of speaking to how the season's going, I thought that Shiano was surprisingly candid when he said he had the best night's sleep he's had in a decade after the win. And <laughs> um, then he had another great night's sleep on Monday. Do you feel like that win really just took so much weight off the staff and the players' shoulders because they've gotten so close to a bowl the last two seasons and they've kind of waned down the stretch? Do you think they'll just be playing a lot looser and, and kind of just not as tight over the last four games than they, they have in the past few years? Yes and no. I think it's it's a huge burden off Greg's shoulders, right? Because he's talked about the team being better and getting better and showing progress. And at the end of the day, the unfortunate thing is it's wins and losses. That yeah. That's what shows progress. And, you know, even though they've gotten better, people don't want to hear it. Um, so for him, it's like sign, finally some validation that we are getting better and we're doing the right things. Um, I think as far as the team goes, I, I don't know if it's kind of a any sort of a load off their shoulders. I think they've been playing very confidently. I think they're going to continue to do that, right? They're, when, when you win games and e even when the game isn't, you know, the prettiest, but you find a way to win, you're able to build confidence. And that's that's what I see this team right now. I see them as a confident team that, you know, are going to get punched in the mouth and you're just going to get right back up and punch again. Um, so from – the aspect of like playing loose because they're ball eligible, I don't think so. On the flip side, if they hadn't have been able to beat Indiana, now you're trying to figure out, well, shoot, we have Ohio State coming, then we have Iowa, then we have Penn State. Like, how do we find another win? And I think then they would have start, started the press. Now, 
you know, uh, you know, as we look at it, you know, again, they're playing with confidence, but they're also playing with house money. Go out and let it rip, you know, and see what happens against Ohio State. Go to Iowa, have a really good chance, in my opinion, to win the game. Yeah. You know, it's going to be a low scoring slugfest, which is what Rutgers wants. You know, who knows what happens out in State College. And then you have Maryland at home. And if you get the right Maryland team, you'll beat them up. If not, it'll be, you know, it'll be a shootout. Um, you know, I don't know if we'll be able to keep up with them if they are they get into shootout mode. But there have been two different teams all year. So, yep. you know, I think they they should they should feel good about this, you know, this final stretch of four games. You just mentioned it, Ohio State's next week. Um, you, you guys actually, your team specifically, has taken down the Giants. What is the biggest piece of advice you could give this team ahead of, going against the number three team in the country? Just got to play your game. Um, you know, the, the coaches are going to put a plan together. You're coming off a bye week, so you should feel – you're never going to feel 100%, but you're going to feel as good as you've <laughs> felt, you know, up to this point in the season. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you, you kind of – you know, as a coach, you don't want to say this, but you got to play a pretty, pretty mistake-free game against, you know, these big boys. You can't have – silly penalties you can't turn the ball over you've got to play field position you know for Rutgers the best thing that could happen is if you know they <clears throat> Rutgers wins the toss they defer they kick it to Ohio State Ohio State goes three and out and then Rutgers has an eight minute possession you know in the first quarter that would be mm -hmm. the absolute best thing that could happen for them yep. you know control the game get some confidence early you know make the other team kind of doubt themselves and think a little bit you know because mm -hmm. listen Ohio State's I think three I saw um, in yeah. the country I don't think they're as good as they've been in the past couple of years. They're still a very good team. Don't get me wrong. Agreed. Yeah. But but not the weapons that they've had in the past couple of years. So I think that bodes better, you know, for Rutgers to be able to play competitively. Mm -hmm. I totally agree. I feel like the the gap between Rutgers and Ohio State has never been narrower than it is right now in terms of when Rutgers was in the Big East or Big Ten. I'm sorry. Yeah. You look at. I think it comes down to like the offensive line play for Ohio State. Like they have. Like an average offensive line, normally they have at least one or two guys who are first round picks. And the depth at the skill positions, like you talked about, like it's not too long ago they had Chris Olave, they had Garrett Wilson, they had, you know, Jackson Smith and Jigba, three first round picks, you know, three wide for them in like their standard formations. Now they got obviously. And a first round quarterback. And a first round, and True. multiple first round quarterbacks in a row between <laughs> CJ Stroud, between Justin Fields. They had Joe Burrow. I don't know why they didn't play, but they had Dwayne Haskins before that. <laughs> Like, I agree. I think Kyle McCord isn't a guy who really scares me. Um, but this is, you know, they have a lot more talent overall than us. And they have Marvin Harrison Jr., who might be the best receiver prospect yeah, in you know, a decade. Um, but, yeah, I agree. I don't – they don't scare me, like, even half as much as they would in a normal year. Is that the read you yeah, get to? Yeah, no. Listen, it's still Ohio State, right? And it's they're, still, they're still – they're still the best receiver in college football. They still have, you know, a really good running back. They still have a great defense. Um, you know, so it's not like we're going to show up and, you know, win the game 14, no. nothing, but yeah, to your point, I think that the gap has closed between Rutgers getting better and Ohio state just not being as dominant as they've been over the last decade, really. Um, you know, I think bodes well, and you know, you got to line up and you got to play, you know, mm -hmm. and, and who knows what happens if you can get it into the fourth quarter, which Rutgers has done that, like against a team like Michigan, they've been able to do that. They match up really well. They haven't matched up well in the past against Ohio State. I think they match up a little better this year than they have in past years, you know, against Ohio State. So it'll be interesting to see. So when we had you on in the preseason, you kind of bucked a lot of trends. You said this is, in your opinion, a seven, maybe eight win team. Your prediction is looking pretty on uh, dead on right now. Where do you see this final four games of the schedule kind of playing out? Do you, do you see a couple more wins still? Like, where, if you had to kind of predict each game, where would you kind of say things go? You know, I think if you look at the last four, I think you got a really good chance to win two. And then, you know, who knows what the other two. Like, again, you're playing in your last four games, you have three ranked teams and you have two in the top five in the country. I, I think Penn State's in the top five, maybe top six. I think six. they're 10 now because of the they're loss last now, week, but the they're, loss, they're but, a very uh, talented yeah, yeah, team, yeah. for sure. I haven't looked since then. I forgot about that one. All right, either way, so Ohio State coming into, into Piscataway, haven't really played them competitively in probably ever since we've been in the Big Ten. I think this might be the first year that we'll we'll play competitively. I, are we going to win? I, probably not. But but I think we're going to show progress. We're going to play competitively, play hard, and, and have a chance maybe in the fourth quarter, you know, to sneak one out. Um, you go to uh, Iowa. I, I think seven ten. 
you know, 14, three type of game. Um, you know, it's going to be a slug fest. I, I really think that, you know, they, they lost last week also. Um, again, we're playing with confidence. We've played well. We know who we are. We have an identity. Uh, we should have beat them last year if we don't turn the ball over and we're able to have yeah. some sort of a, an offense that can get a first down. So, um, so I, I would not be surprised we go into Iowa and we beat Iowa and then you go out to state college and, you know, that's the interesting one. I, I think for whatever reason, since 2015, when, when we should have beat them, um, in the, in the big 10 game at Piscataway, we, we haven't played close at all. I think this is the year that, uh, when, when you look at a season, you, you always kind of circle that one that you have like an upset, right? That no one thinks you're going to win. I, I think for whatever reason that we can go in there and win that one. It's going to be a Saturday afternoon. Hopefully, you know, it's, it's, or, or, you know, a 12 o'clock kickoff. People think it's Rutgers. So, the, you know, there's not 110,000, there's only 95,000, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and you go in and, and you sneak one. That, I think that's the one that you might be able to get that people don't expect. Um, I, and I'm then also you go to not Maryland. very impressed with them at all, Penn State. Like I was, no. I saw the stat the other day. They have the the fewest explosive plays in the Power Five and the fourth fewest in the FBS. They have 18 plays over 20 yards this season. That's for the amount of talent they have. That's pathetic. Yeah, that's not a lot. So that I mean that bodes well because our defense is the strength you know of the team right now. And you know then you finish up with Maryland. And like I said, Maryland is kind of a tale of two teams. You'll you'll either get a team that can't do anything right and and will beat them, or or you know they they have that quarterback that can make throws and they've got some good receivers and all of a sudden you're trying to keep up with them. But yeah, you know, I think realistically two and four with you know a potential to to maybe. Uh, to maybe sneak one between you know Ohio State and and Penn State, but you could also realistically end up one and three. You know, I, I think you win one out of the next four for sure. I, I could see two, two out of four, and then you know if you're really pushing it, then maybe you sneak one of these upsets. Yeah, for sure. Um, well, we really appreciate you coming on, Mike. Do uh, you have anything you want to plug or talk about before we head out today? No, not really. Just looking forward to to finishing up the. Uh, the home, the home stretch on the radio with, with Carlin and the Grand, which has been a ton of fun again. We got two more. Um, and yeah, it's, that's about it. I got one more thing I want, I want to pick your brain on a little bit. And it, did you, you don't have to answer it if you don't want to, but the whole Michigan thing. Do you, did you ever feel like a team back in the day had your signals ahead of time? Um, no, because we, we really made sure that they weren't able to get signals. Like, Nowadays, everything's from the sidelines, right? The, the plays are getting mm -hmm. signaled in. You got three guys signaling. Back then, we used a wristband, and the coach would give me a number. We would change it in between quarters and, and in between oh, wow. halves. So, like, if you ran play number one, I would look at the wristband, there was play number one. In the second quarter, play number one was a different play because we changed the band up. Um, hmm. You know, so it, it's always been a part of the game trying to steal signs, you know, and, and trying yeah. to give yourself an advantage. This kind of takes it to a different level where you're, you know, <laughs> buying tickets on stuff hub and sitting in stadiums and filming it and then uploading yeah. it on the computer and you know whatever else they've done. Um, it, I'll be really, really interested to see how this you know kind of plays out because nowadays the way teams run their their systems on offense, you could 100% steal signals and know what the play is. You know, it's yeah. not like they change signals every week. You might add a couple for a new play, but formation is the formation, protection is the protection, play is the play. So. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how all this plays out. Oh, almost makes you wish uh, Rutgers had Michigan on the schedule coming up. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, absolutely. Did yeah. you see that the uh, the guy had tickets for the Penn State Ohio State game last week, and both they, they didn't. Yeah, they didn't. Yeah, they had both sidelines, and the tickets weren't actually picked up from the ticket office. So oh, clearly, they nice. knew. Oh really? shit! Yeah, yeah. So. Oops. Yeah, I. I I, there was a quote from Jim Harbaugh. He was like, when I was a kid, it, you know, anything to give me advantage against my brothers, I would do. Like, if I could, like, you know, lower the hoop on the basketball hoop while they were shooting, I would do it. So basically, like, he's saying, like, I'll do whatever it takes to win. And it's not surprising that this kind of thing is happening at Michigan. And he's got one foot out the door anyway. Like, he's going to the NFL yeah. after this year, from what I understand. So Pulling a Pete Carroll, huh? Sounds like mm -hmm. it, yeah. Just, yeah. <laughs> you know, pour the whole cheating bag out on the way out the door. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Win the chip and go. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, honestly. But they're saying that they, you know, the the Big Ten commissioner has pretty wide latitude to kind of punish Michigan State, if, Michigan, if they wanted to. Like, you mm -hmm. could, they, you know, point to the, the 
I think they were saying he has like basically as much control over the Big Ten teams as like Roger Goodell does over the NFL team. So if he wants to yeah. say they're il- ineligible for the Big Ten championship, he could do that. Which you actually yeah. look at that from a from a business decision. They're not doing that. No. Well, if you think no. about it, if you if you big brain this, if you do that, you hold oh, them out of the go. Big Ten championship. <laughs> you have Ohio State in it. They win. They're undefeated. Or say they have one loss. Michigan has one loss. You might have two playoff teams then, as opposed to just one. I don't know. Just a, that, just a theory. I don't know. Maybe not. That's a big theory. Maybe not. <laughs> yeah. Uh, All right, guys. We're getting off the rails, but we want to re- yep. really thank you again for, for coming on, Mike. Uh, I'll probably have you on the off season again to kind of talk shop. But uh, for everybody else, this has uh, been another edition of the Network Report Podcast. Signing off.